Welcome everybody and good evening. This is Read Write Local Unbound where we take the author's festival and slice it up so we got one at a time. We're about halfway through our summer of authors and to celebrate that fact our guest tonight is none other than Jack Beltane. Uh, both he and I are live from Avon Lake and some of our visitors might be as well but it doesn't matter we're on Zoom we could be anywhere. Anyway, uh, welcome Jack to uh, Read Write Local Unbound. Thank you. This is uh, this is really great that you did this in the in the pandemic because I know previously we'd had in person events. And it's coming and back. Yeah, I know it is coming back, and I, I appreciate you keeping it going through the pandemic too. Yes, you know what? I didn't introduce myself. I'm Jerry Vogel. I'm the assistant director of Avon Lake Public Library, and I just love uh, talking to, meeting, and working with local authors, which is why we're doing this sort of thing. So, um, so with that, let's get right into it. Uh, Jack, your whole uh, Toy Town stories, your tales. Um, it, you've been doing this a long time now, and it's loosely based on some of your own experiences, but kind of uh, you've uh, improvised with it. How, tell me again, how did this all start? Well, it all started, the very first thing I ever wrote um, that, that I considered, see, so, okay, I should back up. Before this, I wrote short horror fiction mm -hmm. and I had published several short stories with of weird fiction and and horror fiction and then I wrote a short story that wasn't either of those things it was just like a person um dealing with realizing that he had he was going to cheat on his wife and he was trying to figure out why mm. and that was based on a dream that I had and I I have a lot of dreams where I'm not really in them per se I'm sort of just spectating Mm -hmm. And in that particular dream, that was the case. It was it was a guy talking to his wife and basically admitting that he cheated on her. And you know why? How would he have done this? And so, in me trying to figure out just fictionally how a person would go from you know a loving marriage to cheating on his wife and separating, how would that happen? That was the whole "Am I the Matter?" story kind of came out of that. But as I started to write that, and that's the that's the first book in the Toyland Tales. So I yep. am the matter, yes. The and the tales. as I started to write that, then Creative Writing 101 kicks in, which is where they tell you you should always pull from things that you know, which is your own life. And so I just started weaving in things that were from my life. And the rest they say, you know, it's history. It's that's it just kicked it off and I, I started doing more of those kind of stories mm -hmm. and now I haven't written a horror story in 20 years so so then after that we have three dances uh yes in strict canonical order here and uh, yep. these are mostly following the adventures of somebody who had a roughly parallel life like you growing up and becoming a becoming a big person right that's kind of what this yep. is about yeah that's it started to dip into okay well what did this what did this character do in high school How, where did this character come from this you know jack guy and that was when it started to to take more shape and become much more about me um as a person and then by the third book in a yellow field that one started to really blur the line a lot between you know fiction and fact so this one turns in almost meta fiction, like uh, keeps, yeah. keeps them guessing. But by that time, of course, I had created characters that I then had to keep up. So, and you know, some some of the people on the screen have little pieces of them have ended up in characters, and I'm they may or may not recognize themselves in in parts of some of the characters. So why don't you introduce us to your main cast of characters here, Jack? Let's talk about some of the people who keep turning up and maybe where they came from. Yeah, well, there's there's not a one to one, but um, it is it is interesting that two of the guys. So at the end of Penny Harper, Jack and Gray drive across Pennsylvania to go and see Lush and visit their old friend. Oh, good boy. I'm going to screw up the names of my own books. Uh, they go to see Jolly. Hmm. Yep. And so what we have is Tim is was what's gray i guess for that scene it's gray isn't really based on tim per se but for that scene tim and i drove across Pen pennsylvania 
to go to Philadelphia to see Brian, uh, who hosted us, and we all went to the Lush concert. So that that was it was kind of interesting that I was able to to put that in there, mm -hmm. kind of the last minute. And that's you know, some of it it started to become a scrapbook for me. I just wanted to capture that memory. You know, I, I always joke with my wife that when I'm 90 and I'm on my deathbed, I can read my own books and remember things that I did, even if my memory is gone. They're so a little bit of that sort of lead in. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. Talk about some of the other people that we see throughout your books that, we, that pop in and out. So um, let's see. The, the main characters probably that most people think of are from the high school era, which would be Niz, Sammy, Jolly, Jess, Toby, obviously. Um, Toby is based largely on a girl that I hung out with in high school and my wife. So I, and my wife, I didn't meet till college. So it's sort of like, I just took, you Imagine know, Imagine you met people. her earlier sort of thing. Exactly. That's exactly right. Okay. And so a lot of those stories come from that. Uh, me and this girl in high school, we, we went to all the major dances, except for like two of them, I think. And we always went as friends. So it was, it was very much in keeping with the book. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny at, in high school, everybody, like all the parents and, you know, our friends thought, me and this girl were going to get married to each other. Like we would be the first people to get married. And we were the first people to get married, but we did not marry each other. We married different people and we're both still happily married to those people. So it all works out. Um, then you got Niz. Niz is an amalgam of probably three, at least three people. Um, Anybody here? <laughs> nobody here, I don't think can't see the last I can't see the last name on Mike so I don't know if that's the mic I know or not um and then there's Jess Jess was an amalgam of another couple of people I hung out with in in high school uh but what's funny is the the one of the the women that Jess is based on the, her career path after high school I stole and gave to Toby. So Toby's career path in the books was actually this friend that I knew in high school. So that that's sort of how I start to weave it all around and, you know, really muddy the water. So it doesn't end up really being fair to call it anything other than fiction. Okay. Um, so somewhere in between here, there's Company of Tatters. And where does this fit in the uh, the canon here of uh, of the timeline and everything? That's, I think that's about the only linear story I've written in that it starts and just goes through chronologically. Nothing skips back and forth. It's a straightforward thing, yes. About yep. the last year of high school and everything. Yep, and it just goes through through the last year of high school. And I, I think what inspired that was that was around the time that my son was you know, starting to graduate or getting, I think he was a junior or so in high school. And he was talking about how they were going to graduate and all that. And I just started to realize that when, when I was going through it, I think it hit me hardest because at the time I didn't realize it was happening. Like it wasn't until I got to college and I was like, oh, wait a minute, I'm probably not going to see those people again or not, not as much as I used to. And so I just wanted to, you know, go back and almost relive the glory days, I guess. And that's what that book ended up being. You, it seems like a common thing that people always go back to. These are the best years of your life, but for some people, they're pretty awful years. But your last year of high school is something, certainly, for, for I think, everybody who's been through it. And uh, almost like the end of almost everything you know in the beginning of something else. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, and then what you did is uh, something interesting. If you want to repackage, redo, and everything, is you put your Toyland Tales. You have an omnibus here of three of the books. Yeah. And that was a couple of years ago. And your brand new collection here is your sampler of the greatest hits, the hits so far. And so there's the short version, abbreviated, including some of your poetry and things like that for people who just want to try you out. So you've got the long form and the short form and the in-between forms. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all it's all cost cutting because I mean, at the end of the day, I'm I'm a fan of 
a lot of entertainment. And so I buy tons of records and books and, you know, all that comic books. So I'm very aware that people are spending money on these things. And so I, I put the first three novels because they were all kind of short novels. So I was like, well, I could put those three together and cut the price. You know, if you buy each of them separately, it's going to be like 30 bucks. If you buy just the one volume, it's 20. So I cut 10 bucks off. So Value for money that for was that. Mm. But then the sampler, I realized, well, you know, it's still a lot of money to ask somebody to try out an author that they've probably never heard of and don't know anybody who's heard of them. So I, you know, I took a page from the record industry and I was like, well, I can just put together a greatest hits, just put together scenes for my books that I think, you know, illustrate the way I write and make that a really low cost uh, of entry to see how good I am or bad I am, depending on your opinion. And so that book's only $5 and it kind of reads like its own short novella in a way, like I, because I was able to take those scenes and then I put them, my, my books are non-linear, so they're constantly going back and forth in time. But with that, with the sampler, I put them all just straight in order. And then I, I cut them up a little bit so that I didn't have any big spoilers in there. So it wouldn't ruin any of the books if you want to go and read them. But you kind of get the the nutshell story of Toby and Jack, which is really what the whole series is uh, about. And that I find just just fascinating that uh, you've taken a lot of these, uh, like I said, music industry <laughs> marketing techniques and made them work for your uh, thing. So I can I can completely relate to that. Um, and then also music industry marketing techniques, which require sometimes merchandise and um, and uh, premiums and things. You went and created a game. Yes. A uh, game, Rumors. This is the Rumors game, folks, that uh, was provided to me by Jack. And it's a card game. And we even have some uh, Toby and Jack ships here and everything. So uh, it's, uh, wow. why don't you talk a little bit about what, how you decided to, to, to make a game involving the character of your books and, and what this game really is all about? Yeah, so the game started actually right before the pandemic my me and my family took a trip out to uh, a uh, indoor water park around here and i had bought a game called for the queen which is actually a good game but it's it's a storytelling card game and all you do is you take prompts and you're supposed to tell a story going around the table and then at a certain point the story tips and you have to make a decision and this sounded like something that my family and i used to do we would have you know campfires out in the out in the backyard and we would sit and tell stories but we would make them up and each person would get you know like a minute to tell part of the story and then we move to the next person i can tell you that doesn't work so well with young kids but it was still a lot of fun um so i thought this game would be really good and it, and it was and we had a lot of fun with it but almost immediately and i don't know if it's just my family or every every family we started to you know, rewrite the rules. We're like, well, if it actually went like this, it would be more fun. And if you did this, it'd be more fun. And so it just got me thinking, I was like, well, how would I storytelling card game? That's, that sounds like something I should really enjoy and be, you know, and maybe even have. And I started thinking about how, how would I do this? And I realized that you could very easily turn my characters into a storytelling card game. And so that's what it is. You're, the setup is you're trying to determine if Toby and Jack are going to be dating by the end of the week. Because in the books, they're sort of on again, off again, the whole of high school. And nobody knows if they're dating or not at any given moment. So then I just made a bunch of prompts that, in theory, you'll go around the story and you'll be, you're sharing the rumors that you have heard about Toby and Jack. And after five rounds or five days, by the end of the week, you will have determined whether or not you think they're going to be dating. And then that's the end point of the, of the game. So there's not really a winner. It's sort of a group winner type of situation. Yes. I've but, heard about some of these uh, cooperative games, ungames or something like that, where, uh, yeah. and, and, you're, and you're right, it's more of a storytelling exercise with prompts. Uh, you, you get the characters to try different things out and people run with that and people make as much of the game as, as you've made of it, they're creating it themselves. So that's, that's a really transformative thing you've done there. And uh, actually, did you know this, uh, Jack, but we started a circulating game collection at the library. Or did I show you that when you came to visit that time? 
I think you might, you might have mentioned it, but I don't know if you got too far into it. Tell me about well, it. That sounds cool. Well, we got a lot of these uh, sort of strategy and board games and like these, uh, you're not so much your snakes and ladders and uh, operation, but you're involved uh, role playing and other sorts of adventure board games. And Gina, our teen librarian, is really into these things. She's, we got about 20 of them now. And uh, you could check them out. And I intend to add this to the collection. Oh, that's awesome. Because uh, there are a few other card related games too, including the family version of Cards Against Humanity. So, um, you know, it, it's something I think that'll be very interesting. I don't think I've ever had a local author create their own game before. I'd like <laughs> to think of any library who has. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can get in the Guinness Book of World Records. Yes, it's a real one-off uh, fun thing. So I think it's great that you've done that. Um, why don't we shift more into about, you know, we, we talked about your books and, and what went into to making them and how you got started. Is Grave Worm Press, that's you basically, right? Yeah, that's that's me. That's from my own horror writing days. I figure horror, goth days, the scary boo sort of stuff. Um, have you found that when you're publishing your, your writing, sorry, let's go back to just writing here. If you are um, writing something, what kind of a writer would you call yourself? Are you like seat of the pants or do you diagram all this stuff out? What kind of systems do you have to make these things happen? Or do you have? Uh, yeah, I don't outline, which mm -hmm. most writers say I'm doing it wrong right there. But I, I am very much more sort of the Jack Kerouac, you know, the beats vein, I just start writing. And usually I finish the one scene and then the next scene will occur to me. I'll know what's gonna happen next. Or in the term, and that's why my stories end up nonlinear because I might be like, oh, well, I need to actually fill in something. You need to know we'll something that happened in the bit. past. Yeah. yeah, and then go forward again and then go back a little. And it just sort of happens like that. And at a certain point, it's just, it's over. I don't know how long it's going to be. I don't set out to make it a certain length. I just know that's the end. And then people always say, oh, I want to read it. When I finish a first draft, they're like, oh, I want to read it. And I'm like, no, there's no way. Like my first drafts are so bad. I, it's going to be at least draft five, six or seven before I will let anybody even look at it. Mm -hmm. And in those draft, those, you know, five or six drafts, I'm completely rewriting it. And for me, that's where the writing actually happens. Like the first draft is almost my outline. Mm -hmm. And then I do all the rewriting in the, in the subsequent drafts. Well, that, that's very fascinating because uh, at one point you were um, facilitating our, our writing group at our library as well. And I remember you talked a lot about the importance of draft, redraft, redraft. You were sculpting this thing as you go. Yeah. And uh, some people can maybe come up with a spreadsheet that will show you how this character goes, but you're kind of letting almost it automatic writing. It's the universe is pouring in your head and this book's coming out little by little. I think I think I was inspired, not that I designed it the way I write, but I, I felt uh, backed up on the way I write from uh, Stephen King, because he he talked about the Fornets. He actually wrote a whole, one of my favorite short stories is Fornets Ballad and Fornets. Flexible Bullets. Yep. Yep. Uh, and, and, little elves living in the typewriter. <laughs> yes. Yep. And they're the ones that are actually telling the story. And he's just sort of the tool. And he he often has, you know, he's, he talks about how his characters will do something that he didn't expect them to do. And he just has to go with it. And I remember that always stuck with me, too, because I'm like, how does that happen? But now that I've, you know, written, put more effort into my writing, which I think I have done with these, you know, the Toyland novels, I realize how true that is, that there are certain points where the character just suddenly does something. You're like, this is the natural thing for this character, this person to do at this moment. And so I'm going to let it happen, even though it kind of derails maybe the scene that I had coming up. I'm going to let it happen and see where that takes the story. Yeah, I've heard this now from a few authors in our series so far. They have characters who take on a life of their own and they talk back. Yeah. do their own thing it's almost like a little bit like playing god you're creating this universe but god also gave us free will right so exactly to keep things interesting uh we let the characters do some some things so that's good to know yeah um, and it it helps too with them being you know 
lightly based on people I knew, I can always think, well, what would what would this person do? What would Brian have actually done if we rolled up into Philly and wanted to see Lush? You know, I can sort of think what Brian would do and throw that in there a little bit. He didn't kick us out, which is what he should have done. But oh, you did just show show up. And... No, no, no. He knew you were coming. All right, but not like the what that was written later. He did, he didn't have a ton of choice, but he knew we were coming. Yeah, where were you going to go? Um. So that's writing and rewriting. Um, at what point you got other people reading this stuff, and then when do you consider something close enough to be finished to be published? Yeah, so like I said, it's probably around draft, my average of draft seven or eight, probably, before I let other people read it. And I try to get people to read it who I think will be the most likely to not like it, because I figure if they like it, I'll be okay. Because if, if I just get people that think like me and like things like I like, that's, that's just going to be more of me in my echo chamber saying that this is a good story. Yeah, man, it's awesome. Awesome. Keep going. And instead yep. of some reflection on, on, well, I didn't quite get that. Please explain more or something. So Yeah. Hmm. And I also look for people that aren't afraid to tell me it sucks. Like, hmm. I, think, I think we really need that. All artists need that. Um, that people need to tell you when things aren't good because that's how artists start to slip. They just start to believe everything they do is great because everybody keeps telling them it's great and it's not. And there's there's been scenes that have been cut out by the people that I do let read the early drafts, early for me, you know, the draft eight. And they'll say, you know, this scene didn't really work for me. I didn't like the way this person did this. And I'll go back and, and rework it. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of... Um a lot of opportunity for that and then do you eventually get somebody like you turn it over to say a professional editor or proofreader or are you taking care of more of this most of this still yourself uh i try to get somebody to go through and i have a he he just appeared uh eric there um mm -hmm. has has already pre-agreed to proofread my next book so he's on the hook for that mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Um, is there, a, and you do basically everything in this thing. You're laying these things out, you're designing them, you're sending them off to the press. And then at some point you get back either boxes of books or you have a, um, uh, a print on demand sort of uh, model here. And yep. then there's the part that every author wants to know about. Now I've got these books, now what? Yeah, if, well, things I wish I knew. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think honestly, and this, this isn't just, you know, to, to Brown knows because you're hosting the event, but hook up with your local library. I mean, I, I have done more work with libraries than I have done with any kind of so-called professional type institution. And, you know, a lot of the, the book fairs and things like that, they don't want you unless you can show up with distribution and 5,000 copies. They they don't even want you. You're not going to sell 5,000 copies. They just want to know that you can do it or that somebody, some distributor has said you can do it, which really does not help independent authors at all, you know, because, and I realized, you know, there's a glut. Everybody, everybody thinks they can record songs. Everybody thinks they can write books. So, and it's, it's a harder sell with books. It's harder to find out that somebody isn't good with it's a time. CD. You can, yeah, you can listen to a CD in 30 minutes and realize that they're not that good. Yeah, there's a lot um, of investment in, in reading uh, and reading yeah. closely, especially. So I, I do understand that, but that's where I have found the libraries have been really good at being gatekeepers on, on what is truly worth putting on the shelves for people to read. Well, th well thank you. No, you're not brown nosing here. I, I, I recently actually did a presentation for somebody on Zoom about for local, for authors trying to get your books in the libraries. And it's amazing how many of the authors there had never thought about something like that. Yeah. And then all the things that they're gonna to need to think about if you get it in a library, which sometimes is like a bookstore or, or a major publisher or retail, but libraries are different in many ways. Uh, but, but I think we're always about our local communities. We wanna encourage not just what you've done, but more people to come forward and that we can share these things and that things grow from there. That's what I love to see and that's why I'm glad, especially when writers get involved, like the, like the, uh, the writers group, um, and then they meet each other at these festivals. I think that's yeah. when really interesting things happen. 
Yeah. Hmm. I'd always wanted, I'd, I'd kicked around an idea to um, start almost like the good, good housekeeping seal of approval, but for independent authors where you could just send it to somebody and get a seal of approval. And, but, you know, and there are organizations that do that, but they all charge you money. And that's the thing. It's like, it's just like with indie artists, with indie bands trying to come up, they don't have money. You know, that, that's the one thing they don't have. If they have money, they could promote themselves. But yeah, with yeah, money, you can do anything. A work in progress. A lot of times it's just getting your right thing into the right ears or eyes at the, at the right time. Where yeah. you'll find these champions who will just go to the wall for you because they really believe they've seen it, they've read it, they've heard it, they believe it. So, yeah. And maybe the library is a way a lot of people could find your stuff alongside a lot of, you know, popular established authors. Because, you know, we don't, we don't put all our local authors in one section. We interfile right. them with all of fiction and put stickers up. It's local. So hopefully people will try that out as something that uh, maybe they hadn't thought about that they might be interested in. So, yeah, I know that happens sometimes, hopefully more than sometimes. It does. And, the, you know, the library journal has that whole uh, biblio board where, yes. where you can you can borrow electronic copies of the books. Yes, we have Biblio board as well in our library, and you can um, you can actually check out his books there. And you do have books as well, I believe, on Overdrive and maybe on on um, Hoopla. I'm not sure. I didn't check those carefully. Yeah, I don't I don't know if I do. It's because somebody else put them there. Like I mean, with my permission, like I signed up for something and they, they put them there. I don't remember putting them on on those two, but they could be there, maybe through Biblio board. But you don't have anything with, say, Smashwords or Draft to Digital with any no. of your ebook aggregators. Okay. No. Well, I am um, something to look into maybe sometime. Yeah, for sure. Books because I think if you get on one of those aggregators, then they pick the books that they're going to use, but they could end up anywhere at that point. Plus, you know, you've got an in here with Overdrive, they're an Ohio company. So, you know, they're always looking for things. And so yeah. is Hoopla. They're with Midwest Tate out of Toledo. So, uh, you know, Ohio is sending library stuff all over the world. So, uh, yeah. Um, I guess the other thing is then, are you starting to feel that this universe of uh, uh, that you've created, are there people out there responding to it? Are you hearing from people on your social media and so on, uh, asking you about your books, giving you their impressions of it? Uh, is that sort of thing happening much? Yeah, it's not, you know, I'm not a celebrity. I, I can still walk down the street. Nobody knows who I am. Um, but yeah, and what, what I found is there's actually a great response in England. I have, I have a lot of people in England and it's, I have family in England, but it's not my family. It's uh, strangers that I met on the internet, basically. Um, and, you know, the music tie-in, there, there was a music social network called Soundtracking for a while it's it's been gone for years now but it was through that that i made a lot of connections that we all started you know there was a lot of artists that, that's how i met the you know the guy that drew toby and jack there behind me right now mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and he drew the company tatters cover and so it, it became sort of a little collect online collective of artists and that was kind of neat but i had always said to my wife that i would quit I would, I would keep going if even one complete stranger wrote to me and said that they loved my book and it happened. Like out of the blue, I had a PO box and I got a, got a little note in the PO box that basically said, hey, I loved your book. The, it was the, uh, the last chapter of Am I the Matter? And he said, it, it got me through a rough patch. I really love the book, keep going. And so I said to Elizabeth, I'm like, well, that's it. I I got to keep going now. And keep going, you did. Yep. Yes. So you've been over to England to visit some of these folks? Uh, not the not the strangers I met on the internet. No, it's it's. Um, I've seen my family. I probably in that timeline, I've seen my family once. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the uh, I don't I don't have the the bank account to get to England. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess a lot of people are going to be uh, are rushing towards that uh, in the near future, I suppose. Yeah, maybe Hopefully. they'll drive prices down. Yeah, maybe they'll just build more capacity instead of hoard it, yes. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I think at this point, we do have a lot of uh, guests on the call here. 
So I would like to open it up to anybody here who would like to uh, ask Jack any questions or make any comments. And yes, they are a friendly audience. They're mostly people who know you. Um, so you can lob any softballs you like. We're, we're, we're all okay. So has anybody uh, got anything you want to say? You can unmute yourself and speak up. Who's first? I'll, I'll go ahead and jump in first, if you okay. don't mind. Um, you, you've talked a fair amount about how music overall, not just uh, the industry, but music itself has influenced your work. Have you noticed any trends in the other direction? Have you noticed that as you're working on things, it has a significant impact on what type of music you find yourself reaching for or something to keep you inspired or just in general, how has it impacted your music consumption? Good that I feel like you sh you know the answer to this, but you don't because you, we've never talked about this. So I do know Jay, but um, yeah, it's that's a really good question. And what's funny is I do I will make like book playlists, and it'll be songs that I kind of listen to to prime myself to write the the book. And it's not like right before I write, I have to sit down and you know listen to my fight song and and start writing. But I'll listen to that playlist a lot because it's got a lot of the same themes. The, the songs that I'm picking have a lot of the same themes and the mood and the general essence that I'm trying to get into the book. And so it'll it'll come out in in that, you know, in the book in that way. It's not the exact songs that end up in the books, but it's songs that feel like it. Uh, the best example is probably um, I have put this was way back when I was writing a company of tatters and she has a red dress and that's th at the, at the end of the book, she's a, at prom, she's in a red dress. And that was a nod to um, summertime sadness by Lana Del Rey, which was on my book playlist that I was listening to when I was writing that book. And in that she, you know, she starts out with, I've got my red dress on, we're going out real big beauty queen style. And I was like, that's, that's perfect. That's the exact vibe. So that's like the, the secret trivia nod, you know, the, the reason Ally McShay has a red dress is because of Alana Del Rey song. So it's kind of that mysterious back and forth of uh, reality and fantasy and your stories and, and what's out there in the music, which I'm sure goes both ways. So yeah, thank you. And anything else, Jake? Uh, nothing, nothing yet. I'm giving it some thoughts still. Okay. Well, is there anybody else who has any other questions for Jack? I missed, unmute yourself and speak up. Forgive me for jumping in late. I'm sorry, I missed the start of the program. Uh, and if you touched on this, I apologize also, but that, Dave, you professionally, you've been writing since before I knew you, but professionally, I came to know you as a journalistic churner. You, you, were, you were cranking it out at, at an incredible pace to, to meet the needs of the places you worked. Was there any ways in which that sort of pace of work informed where you, where, how you work today? Or was it a welcome departure to get away from that kind of constant cranking into a different form of writing? Or how do you sort of reconcile the two in your head? And how much, how much churning do you do these days? If I, do a lot of, I do a lot of churning. I, uh, I, I probably average still at least a thousand words a night when I'm, when I'm going on a good night. Um, I'll take breaks, you know, there'll be several weeks where I don't, but if, if I'm not writing, I get antsy. It's just, there's just no other way to say it. I think what's interesting is the, the influence that it had back then um, was, you know, Jack Beltane, probably people realize that's a pseudonym. And there's a whole story to why I, I named myself after the character, or actually I named myself before the character, but the reason I even took a pseudonym was because I worked with with Eric and I had a professional byline and I wanted to keep the two separate. I by having the same name on both things, it felt like one was work or one was play, and I was getting confused. I mean, it's it sounds dumb, but it, in my head I couldn't keep them separate. So I was like, I need a different name, and that's when I made up the pseudonym that I would start publishing the fiction under, so that I could keep it separate from my professional byline. Lots of people do that. But yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Did I answer your question? It, it was absolutely. Okay. 
And I can tell you the journalism world could use you again too. <laughs> well, <laughs> you were great to read. Thank you. It was just a lot of uh, it was just a lot of throwaway columns with John Lithgow and Ray Bradbury, some highlights. Well, they read they always read like you were having fun. I was. That was fun. And that's actually captured in in um, some of the books for sure. Mm -hmm. In uh, I think it's in three dances. Is it three dances? No, it's Am I the Matter. He talks a lot about being at the at the paper. And there's a scene where he goes and tries to track down a book at a bookstore in downtown Cleveland. And that that was a real memory that I captured with uh, with that guy there, with Eric. Took our lunch and went and looked for a book. Most bookstores are memories now. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> that that reminds me of another question I'm curious about, because as a connoisseur of books, music, and all kinds of, and films, obviously, and things like that, didn't there used to be almost sometimes more fun in the search, the quest for something that you thought yes. a friend recommended, but it's out of print? How do I get this thing? Do I order it from eBay on Germany, uh, order from Germany on eBay? Or, or like I said, this little obscure song that you hear on the radio and you spent years trying to figure out which one it was. And now all that stuff is in your pocket. You can search it all instantly. Do you think we appreciate stuff now that we no longer own it? We just have a tap to a big reservoir. Uh, what are some of your thoughts on that? Because I've had a lot of them. I don't know what to do with those thoughts. <laughs> I, I, I think it's like all things now. Things are just becoming communities. And I think record collecting is probably the, the closest. They're is a huge record collecting community and most i don't want to say the serious collectors but you know there's a good core of collectors that don't want to find those special records online they want to find them in the wild in a store and still have that thrill of discovery and purchase and so i think it's still there i think it's almost become a niche thing but in a weird way i think it's become sort of like the analog, you know, everybody's going back to cassette tapes now, which we couldn't wait to get rid of in the 80s. And now everybody wants cassettes back. And I think, I think there is a yearning for that. But I think by and large, it's much easier to consume stuff on the, with the internet, you can just, you miss out on something, you just find it on the internet. But I personally, I try to keep a list of those albums that I want to find in the wild. And actually, at the start of Penny Harper, he finds the single uh, Jungle Boy, going to forget the guy's name. I think it was John Eddy or something, but that, that was a literal in the wild find that took me, gosh, probably 30 years to actually find that song. And what was, what was neat is I had recorded it off the radio in the early eighties. And I had always loved this song, but I never knew who it was. And I didn't know what it was called and we didn't have the internet. So I couldn't look anything up. I couldn't do Soundhound, and I had just always loved this song. And it was probably, probably when the internet came, you know, finally got going, I was able to look it up and figure out the song and the artist. But then I was like, but I want to find that song like I would have found it in the 80s. I want to go to a record store and buy the single. Well, he was kind of a no name, like nobody's ever really heard of him. So his singles weren't out there. And I was at the, the Beachland, the Beachland Tavern, Ballroom and Tavern. And they have that the little thrift store and record shop in the basement. And I was there and it was front and center right when I had started writing Penny Harper. And it just felt like a sign. I was like, okay, I'm on the right track. I should be writing about being 16 because I just found this record that I've been looking for since I was 16. So yeah, I just found a record like that too recently, but I did find it on YouTube because I had no idea who the artist was. I just remembered the song and that there it was. Yep. And uh, you get kind of obsessed with this stuff. But yeah, a lot of it's just, it's been dematerialized. You know, all these things had containers and the containers weren't really connected other than the connections you made yourself. Now there's so many people making connections between these songs, these books. You're right, it's a community. You step in and people are all sharing this stuff. And maybe that's what takes some of the, uh, uh, you know, the disappointment of having everything dumped in, in your head at once is that you've all found it for each other. Where yeah. before you were on your own. Yeah, I think I think there's something to that. And I can tell you, Brian and Eric, I think we both met through music in a weird way. Uh, Eric was blasting a song that I wanted. So I asked him if I could borrow the CD and here we are. And Brian, 
I think was also blasting, or I think it might've been a roommate that was blasting something. And I came into the room and there was Brian and, you know, it's, it's just funny how these, it seems like all the major things to me are hinged on music. I can hook them back to music and I've been kicking around writing an actual memoir, which I don't think I would do because I think at the end of the day, it would be boring. But if I did it, it would just be me telling you about a song and the first time I heard the song. That's how I would write the memoir because I, all through my life, I feel like I have these touch points. I know exactly where I was when I first heard Led Zeppelin's No Quarter. You know, it's that kind of thing. And, and that's a neat little story, probably. Songs and smells. These things are yep. very impactful. <laughs> Not so much smells, thank God. But Oh, but smells, I guess they tie right yeah. in there with places yeah, and specific know. memories and times. They're very powerful things as well. I was just thinking back to college. I'm glad I don't remember those two guys because of their smells. That's all I'm thinking. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was mostly cigar smoke. <laughs> it's true. A lot of unique smells. Many smells. Um, any other questions here for, uh, for, for Jack about uh, the books or about the, what he does? There, there's a picture of you, Jack, looking like you were singing in a younger age with someone playing guitar. What, what is yeah. that all about? Uh, you saw my Instagram, and he actually asked about my Instagram. If you want to know the picture, go look at my Instagram from yesterday. Um, yeah, that was a band, a garage band I was in in the late 90s that never got out of the garage. And but it was it was a fun little time. It was a very encapsulated time. It was it was like it was like a, a circle of friends and a time sort of out of time that was just like this little three or four months that we really ran around and had that band and then we all kind of went our separate ways again. Um, but that's going to be the subject of my next book is is that band and that summer that that we spent trying to get it together. It fell apart before we got it together, but. I still contend we could have been something. Could have been contenders. Yes. Exactly. Mm. All right. So you've demonstrated for us that you're proficient in multiple, multiple, multiple media aside from just your writing. Um, what else can we expect to see coming from you in the near future? I don't think this is where you were going, but Jay is a fantastic musician who writes under the name The Good Chemicals. And you should go to Bandcamp and you should check it out. And he and I are trying to cook up a little project where there, one of my favorite podcasts is called Desert Oracle Radio. And it's a guy, he's kind of just telling stories about life in the desert. And he has a band in the back that's just, you know, making incidental music basically. And I was like, wow, I, I don't think I could ever do an audio book but that would be neat to just tell stories and, and have music in the back. And then I realized that I've, I've written stories. I could just read my stories. I wouldn't have to invent new stories to tell. So I started to cook all this up and then I was listening to uh, The Good Chemicals and I'm like, this would be perfect background music because it's mostly instrumental. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start looking into that, doing that. Uh, I don't know if that's what you're going for, Jay, but what were you thinking? That's what I was thinking. I mean, honestly, I wasn't shooting for the shameless, shameless self-promotion, but I will take it. <laughs> I, I just wanted to know what medium you're going to conquer next. Oh, Movies, I see. TV, video? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I would still like to write a comic book, but that's an even harder business to break into. And yeah, I, I need an artist. <laughs> So I want you to conquer fashion again, Dave. Get back into the t-shirt business. Yeah, yeah. that's what uh, Tim's wearing there. My failed t-shirt industry. Right. Yeah, me and a friend at work started a, this was back in the 90s too. We, we decided we we're gonna start a, a t-shirt business where we would make the shirts that are incidental to movies. So in, well, I probably shouldn't say the word, but in, in the jerk, at the start of the jerk, there's a kid wearing a shirt that has bull S, you know, really big on the shirt. So we were like, you know, shirts like that, you're not going to find them anywhere. We'll just make these movie shirts that don't really exist and, and we'll sell them. And we called it jerk shirts because it was the jerk that gave us the idea. Mm -hmm. And probably within three or four months of us deciding we were going to start doing this is when Cafe Press came online. 
and anybody could make any shirt they wanted <laughs> for a lot cheaper than we could do it. Mm. So eh, it just died almost immediately. We were like, I'll oh, forget it. Because we were soak screening them in our garage. I mean, we were trying to, <laughs> we were doing real, it. Real works of art, work of yeah, old labors school. of love. Soak screening, yes. So yeah, comic books and t-shirts. I do have t-shirts now, but I don't make them. They're, they're print on demand. Had you ever thought about anything like if somebody might pick something like this up for uh, some independent movie or television or some, some video based thing, storytelling with actors, plays, anything like that? Uh, that would be fantastic. And yeah, if if anyone in those positions happens to hear this, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, yeah, I think that would be cool. I think a company of tatters could really be a probably almost turned into a CW series, quite honestly, mm -hmm. <laughs> and pretty, pretty seamlessly. Right. Anybody else want to want to weigh in? Well, we're enjoying the silence, but not for long, <laughs> as the Depeche Mode would say. I just um, thinking maybe we should wrap things up a bit and um, and because uh, we've had a pretty good conversation, and I really want to thank everybody for, for showing up and contributing. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say before before we uh, check out here, Jack? Wow, no, I didn't. I did not prepare any closing arguments, Your Honor. Um, <laughs> <laughs> buy, buy more books, not just mine, buy other people's books. Anybody, any books, they help people write more books, yes. And if you don't know what to buy, go to the library. They'll help you borrow books. Yes, and if it's that good, you're going to buy your own exactly so as we were talking earlier uh november november 6th put that on your calendar it's a day when we're going to have lots of authors like jack come into the library where you can meet them and buy their books chat with them uh so that's something read write local the original volume three it's coming up so uh that's in november and meanwhile we keep rolling uh, every tuesday night this summer with a new author every tuesday so this has been Read, Write, Local, Unbound. My guest this week has been Jack Beltane of Avon Lake. And we've had a lot of his, uh, a lot of his past has kind of caught up with him here and a lot of his friends and pals and things. So I want to thank all the guests for being here tonight and making it a lot more fun. Yeah, thanks guys. Yes, thank you. Okay, so we'll see you next week.